Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, everybody. Inshallah, uh, today we begin a new journey. Actually, it is a continuing journey because we've been talking about the lives of the prophets and uh, alayhi salam, alayhi musalam. And alhamdulillah, today we are going to talk about the last prophet. And today's journey is not going to just stop at one talk because there's so much to share about the life of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Alhamdulillah, I hope you're ready because it's a wonderful journey and there's a lot to learn and there's, uh, there's a lot of things that uh, we know and what we don't know. So inshallah, it'll be, um, it'll be interesting for all of us to get together. And not only that, we, we should try and remember that whatever we learn uh, from the stories, uh, from, from what we are saying, we should try and make it a part of our lives in some way. Let's see what lesson we can take today, inshallah, from what we are going to be talking about. So before we begin, the first most important thing is to make dua and to begin with the name of Allah. So let's begin. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. And because we are beginning on such an important journey, as we always do, I'm going to ask for I'm going to glorify Allah's name by saying, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. عدد خلقه ورضا نفسه وزنة عرشه ومداد كلماته Glory be to Allah and praise be to him as much as the number of his creation and as much as what pleases him and as much as the weight of his throne and as much as the ink of his words. And we don't know any of this. So can you imagine how amazing this dua is? And also we ask Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Ali Muhammad. O oh Allah, bestow mercy upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on his al, on his family, on his descendants sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen. And of course, because I want you all to understand what I'm saying, I will use that dua. I always use Rabbi Shrahli Sadri wa Yassili Amri Wahlul Uqadatam Millisani Yafkahu Kauli. O Allah, open for me my heart, my chest, and make it easy for me. Open the knot of my tongue and make it easy for you to understand me. Ameen. And Rabbi Zidni Ilma. O oh Allah, increase us all in knowledge. Rabbana zidna ilma. All of us, O oh Allah, let us become more knowledgeable about what we are learning. But I pray also that this knowledge, we can make it a part of our lives. Amin. So today we are, because I need to tell you a little bit about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how he actually was, uh, where, who were his parents, who was his grandfather? I need to tell you a little bit about the story of that before we come to uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So we're going to step back a little bit and we're going to go back to his great grandfather. Do you know what the name of his great grandfather was? His name was Hashim. And he was given this name Hashim because actually it wasn't really his name. His name was Amr. Amr. That was his name, but he was called Hashim because he was given the responsibility of taking care of the Kaaba. Now, in those days, the Arabs thought it very important, even though they had forgotten their way. Remember one very important thing. I think I have to go back a little bit more because do you remember how the whole uh, story begins at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, how he and um, his wife Haja and their little baby Ismail, they came to Makkah and there was nothing there. And do you remember that Allah gave him that very important task of building the Kaaba? And he stood there and he built the Kaaba with his son Ismail alayhi salam. You remember that? Well, all this happened and because of that reason, and he made dua, Ibrahim alayhi salam made dua. And so this family grew and settled in Makkah. They were not from Makkah, 
but they settled in Mecca and they became part of those Arabs, right? So now this has happened, the story of the Zamzam you know about already, how baby Ismail kicked the ground and how Allah Ta'ala sent the uh, Zamzam for them, like the ground gushed forth with the water Zamzam, Alhamdulillah, and Hajar, may peace and blessings be on her, had to say, stop, stop, Zamzam. And so this water stopped, but it didn't stop flowing. It was still the well of Zamzam. Now all this has happened and many years have passed because remember the last prophet, who was the last prophet we spoke about? We spoke about Isa alayhi salam, remember? Um, what the Christians call Jesus and we call Isa, he was the last messenger of Allah before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. All these prophets that we have spoken about came from, there were two brothers. Remember, there was Ismail alayhi salam and there was Ishaq alayhi salam. From the family of Ishaq alayhi salam, you have all these prophets that came down. There was um, Musa alayhi salam, Dawood, Dawood alayhi salam, Sulaiman alayhi salam, there was uh, Isa alayhi salam. And so everybody was waiting waiting patiently for the for another messenger because they knew even in the books of the Torah and the Injil, the Torah and the Injil, what was the Injil? The Bible. Even in the Bible, there was a mention that one day there is going to be a prophet that is going to come. So everybody was waiting for this prophet. They knew there was going to be a messenger that who was going to come from Allah. Now we all know that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last messenger. We know that there is going to be no prophet after him. But in those days, centuries ago, like 500 years before the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the people knew that there was going to be a messenger who was going to come. And they didn't know where he was going to come. They didn't know which part of the, of the world they were going to come. Some people had, had got an idea, the Jews, the people who had the Torah, they knew that there was going to be a messenger and they were looking forward to this messenger. Anyway, so here now I'm coming to the time, like I said, this was the great grandfather I was talking about. So this is about um, maybe about uh, maybe 100 years before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born his grandfather that I'm talking about, Hashim. Now he was actually from the family of Abd Munaf. Abd Munaf, and they were, they were like you can say the caretakers of the Kaaba. So now what they used to do is when people used to travel because people used to come in caravans and they used to come and ka the Kaaba even those days was very special. Everybody knew it was a very special place of God. But by that time, a lot of people had stopped believing in Allah. But here, this man, Hashim, who was a great grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was his job to make sure that people had water to drink and they were taken care of. But he decided to do one extra thing. He decided to even feed them food. Can you imagine feeding people food? Now that takes a lot of money and that takes a lot of work. But you know what? He would sit and he would give them a kind of gravy that they would have. But along with the gravy, he would break some bread into it. So this, he would, as he was break, uh, he would break up this bread into little pieces so that it would become like a porridge for them to eat. And Subhanallah, because of that breaking of the bread, because this word Hashim means to break and to little pieces, breaking bread into little pieces. So the family got this name, he got this name Hashim, and this family continued to have this name Hashim, Hashim, from the family of Hashim. Now remember that, that was the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the great grandfather. That means, uh, let's see, if it's you, then not your father, not your father's father, because that's your grandfather, but your grandfather's father. So that's three fathers above your father right? Three, one, two, three. Yes. Subhanallah. So now this um, man, Hashim, used to take care of the Kaaba and he was a very good man. He was very generous. He used to take care of the people when they would come into town. Not only that, there was another very special thing that he started. He, um, and now this is the, this is the family. This is like the tribe 
which was known as, I think you all know the name, it begins with a Q. Uh, it's Arqa Quraysh. This was the family or the tribe of Quraysh. And these people were known um, for their generosity and their taking care of the Kaaba. And not only that, there was another thing that uh, the Prophet Wasallam's grandfather started was that he would, there would be trade caravans. People would go for business in the summer and in the winter. So uh, travelers, travelers would go to Yemen, they would go to Syria, they would go to trade with different people, subhanAllah, and they would cross uh, the desert to go to these places and alhamdulillah people would come over so Makkah was a place of a lot of business and a lot of things happening subhanallah now on one such journey Hashim traveled because he used to travel he was going to Syria and on a journey for business and on his way back he stopped in Yathrib Yathrib is now known as Medina but in those days it was known as Yathrib and so he stopped in Yathrib and he married a lady by the name of Salma. And he lived there for a little bit. I don't know how long he lived because I don't really know. Whatever I'm telling you is from information I've got from Hadith. And Hadith is accounts of what the companions of the Prophet وسلم, would write down and would tell each other and then big uh, uh, scholars like uh, Imam Bukhari and Muslim, they would write these down. And so we know a lot of it, of the information which is coming from them, okay? So now as uh, Hashim was uh, traveling from Syria, he was coming back, he married this lady in Yathrib and they, ha they, and they were going to have a baby soon. But he didn't stay to have see his baby being born. He traveled back to Syria. Unfortunately, on his journey or where he was, he passed away. Now, this lady, Salma, who was the gra great grandmother of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, gave birth to a baby boy. And you know, strangely enough, when this baby was born, he had streaks of white hair in his head. So they called him Sheba because Sheba means uh, an old man. So because he, you know, when you are, have white hair, you usually have white hair when you're older, much older. And this baby had white hair when he was born. So they named him, the family named him Sheba or Sheba. Yes. And so he grew he, because the mother was a little worried because, you know, in those days, now remember Hisha, Hashim was not from Yathrib. Where was he from? He was from Makkah. He was like a leader of the Meccan people because the Quraysh were a very important family. They had the job to take care of the Kaaba and they were like the most important Arabs in those days. Now, the mother, Salma, was a little worried because she thought that if they found out that this little baby boy was born to her, they would want the people of Makkah or his family would want to take him back to Makkah. And she loved her son very much. She didn't want to part with him. So she didn't tell anybody about his birth. But because travelers would come back and forth because Yathrib was on the way to Syria and on the way back or sometime or the other, people were constantly traveling, even though in those, though in those days they didn't, they didn't have cars, they didn't have planes, but they were traveling by foot and they were traveling by camels. That was the main way that they used to uh, go to different places by taking caravans through and having the caravans being pulled, caravans being pulled by camels. So here, and horses, of course, they had horses as well. So here, they, um, she, even though Salma did not tell anybody, eventually the word got out. Ah, Hashim has a baby boy and he's living in Yathrib. And so his uncle, Sheba's uncle, he really wanted to bring this baby boy, this little boy back. It was like eight years after he was born. So he went to Yathrib and his name was Muttal uh, Muttalib. This was uh, the brother of Hashim. 
when he heard that his brother's child was in Yathrib, he said, I'm going to go and get this child back. So he went to Yathrib to get this child back, get Sheba back. And when he spoke to the mother and when he spoke to the child, this Sheba didn't want to go. He said, I'm going to ask my mom. I can't just go like that. So his mother was told and Muttalib uh, told her, you need to send him back. He has a lot of important work to do. His father, Hashim, was the caretaker of so much. He was the, it was like as if he was the head. He was the head of the Quraysh family. So he said he needs to go back. He needs to take control of whatever he did. And I have to train him to do that. So finally, Salma, the, the great grandmother of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, allowed this little boy, Shaiba, to go back with his uncle, Muttalib, back to Mecca. Now, when he was returning back to Mecca, on the, as they were coming into Mecca, people spotted this little child with him. And they started looking at him and thought, hmm, they didn't know that um, Hashim had had a child, that he had a son. They thought that probably this was Muttalib's slave. So they said, oh, he's got a little slave boy. So they started calling that little slave boy Abdul Muttalib. That's how he got his name, Abdul Muttalib. And so everybody started knowing him as Abdul Muttalib and not as the name that his mother and his family had kept for him, which was Sheba. But we know in the history that his name was Sheba. So now you know that he's now got another name called Abdul Muttalib, which was really his uh, uncle's name, but only uh, the slave was added to that name. So now as he was growing up, Muttalib helped little Abdul Muttalib learn about what he needed to do, that how would he be taking care of his father's property? How would he be taking care of the Kaaba? What his father used to do? And Abdul Muttalib was a very sensible boy. He was generous. He was wise. He was sensible. He was intelligent. He was smart. He was every, everything good that you could imagine. And he had a character about him that when people would look at him, they would think, hmm, this is someone special. He was indeed special. Subhanallah. Allah chooses whom he wills. And Abdul Muttalib was, uh, was very, very um, able and capable. And he followed exactly what his uncle told him. And so he became stronger and able and uh, he understood what his job would be. One day, Muttalib was traveling outside of Makkah and he too passed away. And so he lost his uncle. And then eventually he had to take care of his entire business. You can say his entire, like his family, uh, 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 his family business. He had to be taking care of everything. So just like uh, his father, ha Hashim, now Abdul Muttalib was the leader of the Quraysh. He was the leader of the Hashmi group. Yes, of the tribe, alhamdulillah, this was his job now. He had to take care of all the people around him. And he was a good man. He was one of the believers in Allah. He really believed in Allah. One, and I'm going to tell you two uh, amazing stories about Abdul Muttalib, which are, which are very important for us as we learn about our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And one of the beautiful stories that we're going to learn about, guess what, is back to Zamzam. We're going to talk about Zamzam. But before, and so what we need to understand is that this Zamzam, even though it was a well, remember that uh, Hajar, may peace and blessings be on her, had to be told, had to tell the water, zum, zum, stop blowing, stop, stop. Now, where was Zamzam at the time of Abdul Muttalib? Would you believe there was no Zamzam to be seen? There was no Zamzam around in Makkah? Hmm, where did it go? Well, you know what happened? Many years before that, there was a quarrel between two tribes. 
I don't really know the names of the tribes, but they fought amongst each other. And the tribe who was the people who were taking care of that Zamzam water decided we are going to hide this well. We are not going to let anybody know about it until we can come back and open it again. We don't want anybody to benefit from it. So they covered it up and they covered it up with their precious gold, whatever they had, and they just flattened the ground like as if there was no well of Zamzam. So anybody passing by wouldn't even know. And as time went by, people forgot that there was even a well called Zamzam. All they knew was from tales that people would tell from long ago that there used to be some well here from the from their forefathers, from the time of Prophet Ismail salam, and it used to flow here. So they knew about it, but they didn't know where it was. They thought probably it's just dried up. Hmm. So when Abdul Muttalib was uh, it was now the leader of the people of Quraysh. He one day was sleeping and he had a dream and he dreamt that someone was telling him, go and dig up Tiba, go and dig up Tiba. And he said in his dream, what is Tiba? And there was no answer. And that person went away. That being or whoever was talking to him went away. Then the second day he had a dream and he said, go and dig up the well that is blessed. And he said, dig up what well that is blessed? Where? And again, that person went away, that being went away. Third day, he dreamt again. Go and dig up the Madnuna. Uh, what is the Madnuna? And Madnuna in those days, I mean, the Madnuna, the word Madnuna means precious, really precious. So he started thinking, what is this? What is this? What is this dream all about? And then the fourth night, he dreamt, and the person find that being finally told him, go dig up Zamzam. So then Abdul Muttalib in his dream asked, what is Zamzam? So he said, it is a special uh, stream of water that flows and which will, which will never stop flowing. It is so much water, so much water that it will never run out. And it can provide water to many, many people. Now, he didn't know where it was. Bakka was like, how are you supposed to find something? They didn't have the, uh, the special instruments that they have these days where they can tap and find where there's water. Uh, remember in the story of Sulaiman alayhi salam, we learned about how the Huthud bird is a special bird that can tell you where water is. Well, here they didn't have such a bird, nor did they have any facilities, nor did they know where to find that. So, but this dream, in this dream, uh, Abdul Muttalib was told that you will find this water where you, you will see some anthills. And where you see these anthills, you will see some crows they will be they will be just uh, pecking uh, around that place so wherever you see that you know that you have come to the right place start digging right there and so that is what abdul muttalib did he went with his son and he started digging and he dug and he dug and when he dug he he found that there was water gurgling from underneath. Allahu Akbar. And of course, when he started seeing this water coming out of the ground, all the Arabs, the people who were part of the, the, his family started collecting around and they said, hey, if that's what we think it is, we are going to dig with you because we want to share in that too. What you found is ours too because Ismail alayhi salam was our forefather too. He's come. It's from our family. So Abdul Muttalib said, no, this is for, for, uh, for me and for my family only. So they decided that they were going to go on a journey and to see someone who will decide for them. And so it is amazing that uh, they decided to take this journey. And on this journey, when they went, they ran out of water. They were going to go and meet this person who was going to make the decision for them. But as you know, the desert and the area of the desert is so dry and it is so like there's no water. What were they going to do? And so in the middle of the desert, 
somehow all of the people who were with Abdul Muttalib, they didn't have any water anymore. What were they going to do? So they were worried. And so they started feeling sick and they started feeling tired and they started, you know, without water, what will happen? You can die. And just at the point when they felt that they were just not going to survive, Abdul Muttalib told them, I think I know there's some water close by. Let's go. And subhanallah, as they walked towards that, they were able, with the help of uh, Abdul Muttalib, Allah put it in his mind. And he, his horse, jumped on that place and outsprung a well. And that was enough for the people, for the people who had said that they wanted to share in the water of Zamzam. They knew that what Abdul Muttalib had been given in a dream and what Allah had blessed him with was something which was just for the family of Abdul Muttalib. They said, what told you now about this well has also told you what you knew about the well of Zamzam. So subhanallah. So that Zamzam well was something that was again, Allah made it come out of the ground again. And this was just a few years before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was born. Subhanallah. So once again, Mecca was blessed with the water of Zamzam that had been put away, that had, was, there was no sign of it anywhere. Subhanallah, isn't that amazing? And one other amazing story that I would like to share with you is the story of the elephants. Do you know the story of the elephants? It's called Amul Fil, the year of the elephant actually. It's a very special year that happened. And I'm sure most of you know about it because you've read Surah Al-Fil and you know what happened in that, subhanAllah. But today I'm going to tell you in a story, okay? So I hope you're going to listen. But before we begin, I'm going to just read this surah out just in case you do not know for the ones who do not, do not know. Surah Al-Fil, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-fil have you o muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam not seen how your lord dealt with the owners of the elephants alam yaj'al kaydahum fi tadlil did he not make their plot go astray wa arsala alayhim tayran ababil and sent against them Birds in flocks. Striking them with stones of baked clay. And made them like eaten straw. So how did this come about? Now what happened? I'm going to take you to a, play, to a person. His name was Abraha. Who was Abraha? Now let's hear. He was a Christian. There was a huge crowd on every side of the glittering church. This was a church that Abra had made. It had been newly constructed. The people were, were in awe. The eyes were in awe. The grand pillars made of gold. The silver reflecting the lights. And the many other expensive metals and jewels used in this unique structure. Finally, al Kulais is built. This magnificent building is what will divert the Muslims of Mecca towards our lands. Abraha, the emperor of Yemen, said quietly to the king of Abyssinia, soon we shall enjoy the trade and monies which they bring to spend on their pilgrimage because they wanted what Mecca, the Kaaba, was giving the people of Mecca. So now they looked at al Qulais, which they had built in, their, in, in, in Yemen. And they said, they both gazed down from the carriages at the ever-growing crowds that surrounded al Qulais. The pilgrims will now come to Sana'a in Yemen and perform their pilgrimages here. Mecca shall no longer retain the power and respect it has held for so long. As news of this beautiful church spread, People traveled from all the surrounding cities and countries to see for themselves this church about which they had heard so much. It was indeed hard not to be in awe of such a sight. As news of the attraction of al Qulais reached Mecca, some Meccans were curious to see it for themselves. They often passed through there 
they often pass through Yemen for business and uh, and trade. And so during one such expedition, some businessmen from Mecca decided to stop and visit Al Quleis. The Meccans were infuriated that Abraha was trying to divert pilgrims away from the holy house of God in Mecca. One of the traveling businessmen in Yemen took his revenge by sneaking into Al Quleis at night and soiling the building. Do you know what that means, soiling the building? You won't believe it. You just won't believe it. But it actually means that he went to the bathroom inside that church. Isn't that sad? Isn't that just sad? That is something that, that is awful. But he did that. Now, what do you think happened? As soon as Abraha realized what had happened, not only did he go to the bathroom, he took that, whatever he had done, and smeared it all over the walls. All over the walls. Subhanallah. So now, it was really something that was making Abraha angry. He was maddened to the point that he started to plan his own revenge. <laughs> How dare those Makkans make Al Quleis dirty? He fumed. The house of Makkah shall be no more. I shall attack and destroy the house of God, he announced to his people. I will take under my command a large army of, of soldiers and mighty elephants. And we will tie chains around each pillar of the Kaaba and at the other end, around the neck of the strongest elephant. So he was just imagining what he was going to do to the Kaaba. Subhanallah. But let's see what happens. Abraha set out from Yemen with his army of soldiers and elephants. They defeated every Arab tribe they encountered along the way to Mecca. They also killed many of those who were against them. A few Arabs were taken prisoner, some of which helped Abraha's army find its way through the deserts surrounding Mecca. So at that time, they didn't have Google Maps. People were able to tell them the direction. So now that these people, Abraha was taking into his, uh, he was cap capturing them, they were able to tell him how to go and where to go. So the Arabs appeared weak as they were very unsure of how to fight against these elephants. Can you imagine, just think about the elephants. The people in Arabia had never seen elephants. Do elephants belong to Arabia? You would never hear of such a thing. You only hear of maybe camels, yes, horses, not maybe camels, <laughs> definitely camels, because camels are known as a ship of the desert, right? They're perfect for that climate. But elephants, elephants was like dinosaurs coming down today to us. If you saw a dinosaur out on the street, what would you say? It was like that for them. Subhanallah. So now here, the people didn't know how to deal with these huge creatures. They had no idea what to do with them and how to fight against them. They did not have the capabilities of fighting against these creatures. Remember, they had no guns. They had no uh, machine tanks. They had no and nothing. They just had their bows and arrows. How are they going to fight against these big, huge animals? So Abraha was having a wonderful time taking up all of these tribes that were on his way and making him making them all his captives. In fact, many Arabs. So let's see what happens. Now, as the army neared Mecca, Abraha called the chief of Mecca, Abdul Muttalib, to discuss the situation. Actually, Abdul Muttalib came to talk to Abraha. And when he came, he spoke to him. And before that had happened, Abraha's men had actually taken away a whole lot of camels that belonged to Abdul Muttalib. He, they, he had killed off the shepherd who was managing all those many camels and had nicely taken, he, uh, his people had taken those camels and brought them and made them part of their army. So Abdul Muttalib, when he whoa, went whoa, whoa. To Abraha, he was very surprised to see that uh, Abdul Muttalib, Abraha saw this man who looked very amazing. He looked, he looked tall and really well put together. 
He looks someone like, oh, this was a man to be reckoned with. This was an amazing human being he was facing. And he thought that this person is really going to be saying something. Now, remember, Abdul Muttalib was the head of the Quraysh family. So he was like the head of the people of Makkah. So now when he's coming to see Abraha, Abraha is delighted. So when Abdul Mutta, so what did he say? When he said, okay, okay, please go ahead and talk. What would you like to say? So what did Abdul Muttalib say? All I need from you is that you return my camels, which you forcefully took on your way to Makkah. That's all he said. Because actually, Abraha sent a message and said, I'm not going to hurt any of you. All I want is to bring the Kaaba down. That's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to harm anybody. But everybody knew he was killing people left, right and center, taking them prisoners and doing whatever he was doing. So everybody knew that when he was going to come into Makkah, what was he going to do? But his main job was to destroy the Kaaba. And what did Abdul Muttalib say to Abraha? He said, I'm, only, I'm concerned about the camels you took from me. I want them back from you. Abraha was shocked. Abdul Muttalib, I had heard many grand things about you. I had not expected such a short-sighted and selfish reply from you. You are only worried about your camels. You seem to be ignorant. You seem to not realize what's going to happen. Do you realize what I'm planning to do? Do you realize that I'm planning to bring your Kaaba down? And he looked like this puffed up man because he had all these elements and he had 60,000 men. I forgot to tell you that 60,000 men as part of his army who were going to come and destroy the Kaaba. Can you imagine how big this army looked? And there's Abdul Muttalib just asking about the few camels that Abraha had taken. Abraha was so shocked. He couldn't believe it. And he started laughing in disbelief. Oh my goodness, look at that. Indeed, Abraha, it is you who does not fully comprehend. So this is what Abdul Muttalib told Abraha when Abraha was laughing at him. He said, I simply need from you my camels as they are my property. They belong to me. I'm asking you for something that is mine. And they need an ant need my protection. What belongs to me needs my protection. The house of Makkah will be protected by its owner. And who was the owner of the house of Makkah? Who was the owner of the Kaaba? It was Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you imagine? So this is what Abdul Muttalib is telling Abraha. I am only worried about my property because I know that Allah is going to take care of his property. Subhanallah. And so Allah does not require, this is what he said, Allah does not require my help in protecting his property. Abdul Muttalib was confident in the protection of Allah. Even the threats of such a powerful man with such a strong army did not scare him in the least. And when this agreement, and with this agreement, the meeting ended. So, Abraha returned Abdul Muttalib's camels to him. And Abdul Muttalib assured Abraha that the people of Makkah would not fight against his army as he entered Makkah. Abdul Muttalib returned to Makkah and told all the people of Makkah, all the inhabitants, whoever lived there, Leave Makkah and go to the surrounding mountain tops. Just leave. Because what Abraha is coming to do? Your houses are just made of mud. Just go, go away. And simply to make sure that they took care of themselves. He then went to the Kaaba and held on to the metal ring of the door and he prayed to Allah. He prayed to Allah. By the way, this door, the metal door, all the when he was digging out the Zamzam. Uh, was digging for it and all the gold that was kept there by the family that had buried that uh, the Zamzam, that gold he melted and made a door for the Kaaba. So now he's holding on to that door of the Kaaba and he's praying to Allah. He's saying, oh Allah grant victory to the people of Makkah and protect your house, ya Allah. 
Only you can protect your house. Oh Allah, protect your house. Subhanallah. And he knew that Allah would protect his house. So, subhanallah. The next morning, Abraha's army moved towards Mecca. At the head of the army was the elephant Mahmud, the name of the biggest, most amazing looking elephant was Mahmud. He was the largest of them all. There was no other elephant like him at that time. And he dwarfed all the other elephants and had been a prized possession of the king of Abyssinia. Now Nufail, who was one of the prisoners who was captured by Abraha's army along the way, had been used as a guide through the deserts on the way to Makkah. Now, as the final approach was about to begin, Nufail went close to Mahmud and whispered in the elephant's ear, Neil, Mahmud, Neil. You know, it is really amazing that when camels, uh, when camels don't want to go anywhere, they just kneel, they stay, and they don't do anything, they just stay. So that's what camels do. And Nufail didn't know because he didn't know what camels were going, what elephants do, but he did what he would tell a camel, kneel and don't move. You're going, this is Allah's house you're going towards. So he whispered into the ear of the elephant. As the army reached the boundary of Makkah in the valley of Muhassir, Mahmud knelt down on his knees and refused to get up or move. Abraha's soldiers hit him with sticks, beat him, but the elephant would not move. Oh, during the commotion, each time Mahmud's, Mahmud's head faced Yemen or Asham away from Makkah, the elephant would start moving. He would even start running. But as soon as he was given direction towards Makkah, he would sit down again and refuse to move forward even an inch. He refused to go towards the Kaaba. Isn't that amazing? SubhanAllah. It was an animal, but he knew. As the soldiers continued trying to move Mahmud, it suddenly became dark overhead. Flocks of small birds appeared in the sky. Each carried three small but hard stones. They say those stones were like chickpeas. You know chickpeas? They're like little pebbles in their in their, in their beaks and in their claws. One in their beak, there was one stone in their beak and one in each of their feet. As they flew over Abraha's army, they dropped their stones on each and every soldier of the army and the stones fell with such force that they killed every soldier they touched. Each soldier had a bird directed towards it. Every stone had the name of a soldier on it. Not a soldier could escape. Allah had planned this whole army to finish. Subhanallah. Look at the way Allah takes care of his house. As soon as Abraha was hit, he tried to move back and retreat and escape towards Yemen. He reached Yemen, but he was in a very bad state and he died soon after. But it was enough for the people of Yemen to see and record what had happened to Abraha and his army. Later on, many years later, Aisha an, says that the person who was in charge of taking care of these elephants, he and his assistant were seen in the, in the streets of Makkah blind and they would go around begging for money. That is what they remember. Many years later, it was about 40 years later. So this Amul feel is something that the people remembered. It was an amazing, unbelievable, miraculous, a miracle from Allah that happened. It was the year of the elephant, Amul Fil. Allah's house had been protected by none other than Allah himself. Indeed, no one can destroy that which Allah wishes to protect. And none can escape any punishment that Allah has willed. The Quraysh of Mecca were held in higher esteem than before. Naturally, can you imagine this happening? Their power and influence were reestablished. Everybody thought they are amazing people, the Quraysh. SubhanAllah. There was renewed peace and security within Mecca. And everybody was doing well. The business was doing well. The future looked good. And SubhanAllah, 
This was how Allah prepared the time for his last messenger to come. Because barely two or three months after this event, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was born. And inshallah, on our next talk, we are going to speak about uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's father and mother, inshallah. And maybe we'll all learn something new and something that you will, um, maybe little bits that you might not have known about. So that's it for today. I hope that uh, you enjoyed what we heard. Are there any lessons we took from today? I think the biggest lesson that I found was, look what something, you know, those people were really mad, the people from Mecca, that Abraha had built that church, that shining church and that beautiful church. And they went and went and did something dirty in there. Is that something to do, even if you dislike something? Should we go and spoil someone's things? That is something to think about. Because if we spoil something of someone else's, we don't realize, but it can cause more trouble, more and more, a bigger, bigger amount of trouble. We didn't do anything good by doing that. So we should be careful about the kind of things we do. We have to be careful about everything we say and everything we do. I think that's the biggest lesson I learned. And also that when Allah helps, Allah can help with his smallest creature because they say that little those little birds were just as big as sparrows. And subhanAllah, they were able to defeat an army which was made up of 60,000 people and so many elephants. SubhanAllah. So we need to pray to Allah and believe that Allah is the one who can do anything. If any of you have heard th come up with any lessons that you learned from today's story, you can share it with us today. Anybody would like to say anything? You have messages. Do I have messages? Uh, surah Al-Fil. Yes, the surah was from Al-Fil and the king of Yemen. Yes, he didn't destroy the Kaaba. And the rocks, rocks are from Palestine. I didn't know that. All I know is that the birds, when people try to see where those birds came from, they were able to trace them back from the ocean. And it was like that they came from the sea. Where did they come from the sea? Where did they come from that ocean? They don't know. But Allah willed them to come. So we don't know anything more about those stones. Anything else would anybody like to say? Yes, you're a very good narrator and a storyteller, Miss Sana. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. I hope you all learned something today. I mean, any Can other? I... Yes, please. Please go ahead. What would you like to say? Did the birds that uh, did the birds kill the the elephants too? They say that everything died. Yes, I, I that's what I heard. That everything died. But maybe Allah protected them. I don't know. But we heard that the army was destroyed. And I think the elephants were part of the army. But um, I don't know. I was not there. All I, uh, I hope that they did not die. Because look at Mahmoud, the, the elephant. It did not budge and it did not move towards, towards the Kaaba. So I hope and pray that that didn't happen. I really don't know. Maybe if someone else knows, I'll find out. I'll try and find out. Inshallah. Would anybody else like to say anything? No? Okay, so we'll end here. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.